final instruction is done. <laughs> Um, hey, John, let's take a little break. Right? Oh, yes. Because Chris is going to be here soon. Sean Rash, because everything moves in this country by way of public opinion. I mean, even if it's wrong, like this O.J. Simpson thing. I mean, he's supposed to be a murderer. He's not convicted yet, but, I mean, he's supposed to be this murderer, but as he's fleeing the police, people are cheering him on because they believe that he is this hero, et cetera, et cetera. So what I wanted to do was to create a project that uh, appealed to the beliefs of people in America as opposed to the education. Because this country moves by belief as opposed to education. So like people are educated on a million different things, but they don't move on their education. They move on their beliefs. Which is also why if you was to say, like, you know, on television, Think this about Haiti might come up, that about Haiti might come up. That's an education, people being fed the education. But they wouldn't move on it. They wouldn't rally around it, uh, you know, do or say something based on this. Uh, it's their belief. And they don't have enough to believe about Haiti to have a belief about Haiti. Uh, they just, it's just, oh, Haiti, that's, that's Haiti, right, exactly, that's it. Uh, whereas if you was to say, you know, Jamaica, you think tourist resort, you don't think about the, the wretched poverty, then you think beautiful island, tourist resort, mangoes, that's belief, the graphic pictures. There is nothing to believe about in Haiti at this present time in America, well, for the mainstream part of America. So the idea of a record came up. Now keep in mind that the idea of doing music is different from the music business. It's a combination of things. So not only do the average American person belief system uh, lacks a, visual, a visualization of Haiti in it, the person, the record company executive, is suffering under the same uh, mentality. Doesn't know anything, doesn't have anything, et cetera, et cetera. So originally, first I went to a place called Geffen Records. Uh, I spoke to a woman named Wendy there, and she turned the project down. Not that she didn't feel the project, the politics of, she has all these other artists on the project, and uh, she wanted to know what it would be like. No, what she felt is that the artists would feel shortchanged if we took on, <clears throat> if Gavin Records took on a project that wasn't an artist, but was getting the attention of being an artist. Because this record that I was, I'm, I'm thinking about is a collaboration record of many different artists from different genres. So she turned it down. Uh, so then I went over to, uh, Warner Brothers and to Virgin Records at the same time. And uh, Warner Brothers uh, spoke to a guy named Benny Medina, in which uh, the first thing he, he said, well, Warner Brothers has to take their share out immediately off the top. Uh, <clears throat> I said, well, fine, let's structure this deal somehow. Um, and let's figure it out. How can we make it work? And keep in mind, the reason I'm even, that I'm even bringing this up is to show you the other side, the politics side. They're more worried about getting a good record than they are about what is actually going on in Haiti and what the object of this record is supposed to be about. They're more interested in just the record itself. So, in the initial meeting, Warner Brothers sort of said, well, we'll, we'll mull over the idea, we'll think about it, uh, you know, we'll have to check and see if we can really do this. Virgin Records said, we'll take it, we'll do it, let's go, let's run with it. Uh, this is a brilliant concept, let's go, let's go, let's go. I fly back to New York. <clears throat> this is in California. I come back to New York. Virgin Records doesn't call me. I call Virgin. Virgin doesn't call me back. I call Virgin again. They don't call me back. Warner Brothers sends a person over here to meet with me, and he says, we're going to take the project, and uh, we'll do it. <laughs> I call a 
version, my version, come on, what's up? Can't, you know, can't get anybody on the phone, it's like they're avoiding my calls. I said, okay, so let's go, Warner, Warner Brothers, I call him Bugs Bunny. Said, let's go, Bugs Bunny, uh, let's do it. And so, the project as it stands now appears to be going through Warner Brothers. Appears, and I say appears because nothing is finalized until it's on paper. Right now we have great commitments from uh, the heads of these companies, this company. Uh, their major thing is who can really come to the table and play the game, the artist-wise. I have a list of artists that signed on to Artists for Democracy in Haiti. They want to know who can really come on and be a part of this. So the other issue comes up now. The other issue is, number one, who does the audience listen to the most? Who is readily accessible to do this project? And where does this project actually go? The first thing, who does the audience listen to the most? It's a cross right now between alternative music, alternative rock and roll, as they call it, and rap. The alternative bands, are all on tour right now. The rap bands, some are on tour. Others are hanging around here in New York, etc., etc. Because my power is in rap music, it's easier for me to put together a rap population. I can do that in two weeks. But the alternative side, which will make the record a more broader record, appeal to more people, is the headache side because they're here, there, 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 there. The artist might want to do it, but the lawyer might say no. The lawyer and the artist might want to do it. The record company might say no. The record company might want them to do it, and the artist might say no. Too many people involved. involved. So all in all, and again, I'm bringing this up again because once again, we haven't said anything about Haiti or the original concept of the record itself. This is just basically the music business, trying to get this record out and done. So I met with uh, two esteemed colleagues of mine, uh, Diana Choi and Dweege. And uh, did I pronounce her name right? Edwige. Edwige. Mm -hmm. uh, and we came to this conclusion that it might be better to, uh, well, first of all, do an EP, which is an extended play record, which is not an album, but it's not a single. It's, uh, you know, a single would have two songs, A side, B side. Mm -hmm. uh, an extended play would have maybe six songs, five songs, an album, ten songs and up. Uh, and reason being is because this project is one that should be constantly going on. So we thought of putting out the rap copulation first, it's number one, it's easy, quick, easy to do, we can just do that in seconds. While that is being done, we're gathering all of these other artists as well to be a part of the project for the EP. I actually ran this by Warner Brothers a few days ago. They liked the idea, but they really didn't want a rap copulation in the beginning but they have no solution as to how to get all these artists together for one recording session. So, let me just talk a little about the record itself. Uh, the concept of this record is to raise awareness. There are artists in, in this country, uh, people respect fads and fashion more than they do laws and intelligence. Uh, so the artist has actually become the politician. Uh, what the artist says, and that's, that goes for all forms of art, not just music, uh, you know, painting, uh, uh, film. Uh, the artist, the creative, the creator of blah, 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 has become the person to speak because I guess uh, that person, that creative person, uh, appears to the public as being pure, as uh, always rebelling against government, uh, uh, 
an independent entity unto itself that is not tied by anything. Whereas the politician is, you know, is tied to government. A businessman is tied to whatever business he's a part of, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, this is where the project, where we're at right now, putting it together as a record, getting certain artists together. Uh, we sent letters out to uh, Sade, we sent letters out to um, uh, Stevie Wonder, uh, uh, you guys were, were going to appeal to some people as well. Uh, and uh, the rap artists are getting their act together as well. So uh, let me pose um, a question. How much rap, no, what kind of music is played in Haiti? Uh, is it predominantly Haitian music from Haitian musicians? Is it reggae, calypso, or uh, or or that or a, a Haitian version of reggae or calypso or rap? Uh, and the reason I ask is because when we do the EP, we don't want to do something that is, you know, totally Americanized. We want to do something that appeals to the people in Haiti as well, uh, and might even and maybe even bring the, those artists in on the project as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, what kind of music appeals to the Haitian people on a broad base level? Well, it's, 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 there's, there's a very, 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 very vital Haitian sound. Sometimes it's called compa. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there's other designations to it. And right. there's two bands who are, have become very popular and who are identified also with the struggle for democracy in Haiti, who we know who are emerging in America, right. which is probably the reason why they're still alive, because they're, they have, have American connections. One of them is a, a band called Ram. It's run by, uh, led by a Haitian-American guy named Richard Morse. We use one of his songs in Philadelphia. Right. The other band is the great Bookman Experience, which we've worked with with videos. Right. They're con very connected, very active in America as well. Right. These two units right away would dive in. Bookman, because they travel a lot and tour a lot up here, more than Ron, which is still kind of struggling, could right. get real involved. There's also a guy named Mano Charmé, who you've seen in some of the documentaries, a solo singer, beautiful oh, okay, voice. Okay, okay, yeah. Mano's in exile. He lives up here. His stuff is just his stuff, you know, right. it's like in his own, he's like a balladeer, right, I don't right, know what, right, right. you can't, you know, he's just brilliant. Mono, I think, would, could be a, a great help here as well. Right. But I want to tell you something interesting in response to that, and that's why you don't want to get too non-American. Right. You know, there's a song that I heard the first time I went to Haiti, I heard it on the radio, and I was shocked because it's a song in English sung very fast. It was on, um, uh, might have been, in fact, I think it was probably in Radio IED, Jean Station. And I thought, that's, that's really a, a strange thing to be hearing down here. What, a, what, a, what a, an anomaly, what a strange flash in the pan, but I love that song, glad to have heard it. Came back on the second trip, I heard this song again. It's a song I've heard on the radio every trip. And you know what it is? A song that's tremendously popular down there, and I'll bet you that 70% of the listeners don't understand a word of it but the passion of the delivery communicates. And it's, it's Bob Dylan's hurricane. It's the damnedest thing. And it's just being sung. Yeah. yeah, and it's like sung with a conviction and an outrage and injustice right. Right. that is, is, is unmistakable, you know? So, um, interesting. Yes, interesting. yes, very. Incidentally, um, I'm confident that that Mr. Dylan would contribute yeah. some lines. And I'm kind of, I bet you anything, Neil Young, who's not on the list, I think Neil Young would come in. Right. And I think if you get one of those guys from that community, well, you know that, yeah. the others will, yeah. Neil's doing it. Right, right, listen, right. lawyer, listen, label, I don't want to right. be out on that. By the way, you, uh, someone else that might be good to talk to is little Steven, who, because yeah. he just kind of masterminded that whole Sun City thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think there was ever more than two or three people in the studio at one time on that project. Like, right. He had his basic track, yep. and people got to wherever they could yeah, get yeah, yeah, and laid something. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, he'd be great to meet with Chris. He'd give you phenomenal advice. He might even help out a little bit. Right. You know, behind, and he might do like he could. He might bring Bruce Springsteen in. Right. Um, and maybe some other people like that. Very um, interesting. Uh, lift me up to what uh, Jonathan. I'm not uh, as uh, close to the technicality of mm -hmm. Asian music as Jonathan can be. Uh, but I approach Asian music because I'm a radio. <laughs> I am the owner of uh, a radio station. But also uh, because of this musical aspect of the reality of Asian culture. And that I would like to uh, tell you. Uh, when Jonathan mentioned compa, he said compa. He could have said merengue because. Uh, they said merengue in America, they said merengue in Latin America. But we say merengue, we say merengue. What, what is that merengue? Merengue is a very one, two, three dance music. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Come on, one, two, three. <laughs> dance music. Right, right. It's a dance music. <clears throat> Changing from band to another band. Very easy, very simple, very elementary. Uh, but having been for years the, the support of dancing, mm -hmm. because in Haiti we love dancing. But the second characteristic of merengue or merengue or compa is that it was an elite way of singing and dancing. Elite, that means the bourgeois, the townspeople, the people living in town, the more than $600 a year revenue, okay? The people who went to school, people speaking French, okay? Otherwise, there is another music. And this music has been for years, for centuries. Apart from the merengue tradition, the compas tradition, the big band or orchestra tradition, the orchestra who played in well-to-do Businessman salon mm -hmm. parties or nightclubs mm -hmm. has been this tradition of music around the drum, the tambour. You know our, our drums, cones of wooden top by the beef skin or gold skin. Around that, you have the vaccine, which is a big fruit of bamboo, but not the fruit you know. No, it's a sound. sound. Mm -hmm. You have also the manimula, Two or three simple instruments. Mm -hmm. And the music around that was created, invented, enriched by the poorest people in the world <laughs> the peasant, mm -hmm. the Asian farmer. Of course, first for their worship of gods, 
first. First, that was the music. And immediately for their entertainment. Mm -hmm. Because as everyone in AD, everyone loves dancing. Separate and non-equal. <laughs> Separate and non-equal. You understand? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. You, 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 you remember? Yeah. Huh? yeah. Okay. I use those word, words uh, because of the similar situation in okay. culture. Okay. Similar apartheid yeah. situation. Okay. And this music was not that simple as the bourgeois music was simple. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I mean, this music was more elaborate. Mm -hmm. Because this music was son and daughters of music who made the trip between Africa and Haiti. They survive the slave holocaust. <laughs> they survive. It's the remembrance of all the tribes of Africa where we came from. From Congo, from Guinea, okay. all the tribes. Every tribe has its music. And you can listen in Haiti music called Yamalu, which is a very special and specific rhythm and dance. And the Yamalu went back to Dago Bay, where part of our ancestors came from. You have Congo music. You have Petro music. Understand? Mm -hmm. Every every music has its own rhythm, its own tempo, its own staccato. Mm. Okay? <laughs> Good. <laughs> See what I mean? Mm. Okay. Then, it was mixed in the Haitian way of life and mixed with the Haitian uh, way of passing time during the year mingled with the work of the peasant. There was a music for for planting, a music for harvesting, a music for waterworks, listen? Mm -hmm. A music for uh, the Easter season, before Easter, the music for November season, called Gede. So, but separate during centuries for the early music. Then, 50 years ago, somebody discovered that there was something to listen to. And for years, it was this very, very painful approach of one music by the other. Okay. Painful because you can imagine the snobism of the bourgeois, mm -hmm. thinking that those people did not know music. Only we as people, without one, two, three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> stupid. Mm -hmm. Not stupid. That's not stupid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. One would be elementary. Correct. Okay? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> then, people more open, people freer, right. start to listen, start to understand what was happening down there. And they start to and be impregnated by it. This process was inside the whole process of at last discovering 
what was going on in the other country that exists outside the small country of the elite, the country, the other country. We discovered Creole because we thought for two centuries that we were a French-speaking country. Yeah. We were not. We were a Creole-speaking country. We discovered their paintings. Yeah. We discovered their religion. We thought that we were Catholic. We were the son of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we discovered that we were son of Azili, we were son of Petro, we were son of Damba, we were son of Ogun, and we discovered that. And so forth and so on. So, there was this painful process of a meeting between a tiny elite and the mass of the people with the whole culture they were uh, they were uh, 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 they were carrying they were carrying for centuries okay so you have two music two musical tradition mm -hmm. and the, the group uh, Jonathan mentioned ran book one experience they are the fruit of this meeting. Not only the old meringue tradition, but now to answer the question, all the, the American tradition, all the jazz, the rock and roll, all, let's say, the sophisticated approach of doing music mm -hmm. with the help of the Western musical world, right. but with the guess of what you, African American, have taught the black, the white American, right. doing music with your guts and merging it with the white musical tradition. You understand that? Yes. We inherit that, and now in. In Haiti, you can listen to uh, all kind of uh, American uh, popular pop music. Right, right. That's it. But from time to time, Haitian say, "Hey, there is something to learn, but also something to instill." And that's Bookman Experience, who won uh, two years ago a, a Grammy. A Grammy. Yeah. Well, you know, by the way, I could have given you a long version too. You know, the John gave you, but I, I thought you wanted a short one. You know. So, <laughs> That's a phenomenal because suddenly it sounded like he was given a style. No, actually, I went there. Is the, to the Grammys? No, no, no. Oh, okay. The hit, the vibe that he was giving. Yeah. Me, I, was, I started uh, hearing it. takes you there. I can see why you're into the radio. <laughs> but that, that rap it also made me realize that, you know, the Neville brothers. Because, you know, we, we, you know, do you, do you have our Combeat compilation of Haitian music, Jean? Do you know about that project? I've got to give you one. We, it's a sampler, <coughs> right, right back from, from, uh, from uh, mini jazz up to, mm -hmm. through Combo, and even with some rara, like Group Fula, I think is on. But it's a great thing. But, but the Neville brothers got involved in this project, Cyril Neville. Who, you know which one he is? The, the, the one with the hat. Cyril's the dreadlocks guy, yeah. The the like a, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, Cyril and, and his brother Charles, who's the saxophone, right. we went to Haiti. They're deeply into the drumming thing, oh, yeah. deeply already. They can become a linchpin wow. for you of this project. They can, like, permeate it. They did a collaboration um, with uh, Les Frères Perrin, mm -hmm. wonderful. Wonderful um, uh, Haitian singer songwriters, brilliant guys. They're both, anyway, I'll tell you about them later, but they're great. And they did a fusion. They took um, a, a song um, that uh, the Lay Fair had written for the collaboration, right. flew in their own stuff. And I kept going, like, nothing happened until they got in the studio in New Orleans and went uh, to uh, C. Saint Studios. Okay. And I kept saying to Cyril, well, like, aren't you going to write an arrangement? You know, yeah, right. like, don't worry, don't worry. Got in there. They didn't speak Creole. Le Frere didn't speak much English. They got in, and when you hear this thing, it's phenomenal. Then we went down and made the video in Haiti, 
and we went up into the mountains and uh, up to Malik. And, in fact, when we were making the video, there was a coup, a military coup against Avril. We got stranded. There was a whole great deal. But Cyril and the Nevilles, and of course that brings Aaron in, right. and Aaron can bring others in. They should get signed up immediately because they could really, you know, help just in a million ways. Right. Um, so anyway, this and what they—they're great at that thing because. Because it's true. How can I feel like such a, a jerk? I give the popular music answer, and of course that roots music, because that's very. It's also, it's the music of the soil, but it's and the history, but it's religious too. I mean, that's so that's voodoo, true. isn't it? It's tremendously the spirit on that level. So that could be a great, great dimension. But uh, Richard and uh, and the Bookman experience. Now they listen to this music. Mm -hmm. And they try to absorb this music, mm -hmm. these rhythms. They try, and I, uh, the, the, the piece you have in uh, Philadelphia mm -hmm. is. Uh, yeah, Ibolele. It's, uh, Ibole. Love that. It's, it's voodoo yeah, music. It's voodoo music. We're going to have to leave today, okay? okay. Please. Oh, okay. It's voodoo music. And uh, the Bookman experience is uh, much more because. Uh, they have a way of uh, of feeling the drums, but without, as they as people did in the past, without putting the whole vibration around the drums. They try to put this vibration all over the musician, and you can understand that when you hear, don't forget something. Right. When you are going to the Asian popular uh, people's music, right. don't forget that the beating of the drum, the drum beat, can make you possessed by God, by the gods, by the law. Right. Basically. Right. Okay? Basically. Of course, uh, you are Westernized. Okay, of course. Uh, yeah. Of course. You are being to school. Yeah, BMW. BMW. Okay, of course. But we have seen many times people like you, like me, spending a night in a place where there was. During maybe three, four minutes, losing complete conscience of themselves, complete blackout, telling stories, and afterwards saying, "What's happened to me?" Jean, okay. Can can I tell a two minute thing yes. that happened to me? Because even we when we went down to make our documentary, right. um, the first one, Hating Dreams of Democracy, we went down with Joe Mendel to um, a very on the southern peninsula, a wonderful, very remote <coughs> um, little village called Marigo. And we went there because there was a, a, a ceremony um, that was honoring two people that had been killed by the Makuts a year earlier. And this was uh, one year after Baby Duck left. So it was a very intense day. And it was a symbolic carrying of caskets um, from one community through a river to another. It was an amazing, very spiritual day, very rich. Came back to Jacques Mel, beautiful, my favorite sound city, town in the world. and. Uh, uh, we stay in this great, crumbling, old, fantastic um, palazzo called the Manoir Alexandre, which is now a, a, a place where you can get a, a room for a night. I went to sleep in this room, and um, the next thing I know, I'm in my bed, and this wonderful woman, a, a woman who was sort of the hostess at the Pension Craft, named Gerta, maybe even know Gerta, yeah, yeah. very heavy set very beautiful, very major person, who you sort of love very quickly when you meet her. And suddenly, in my room, is Gerta standing at the foot of my bed. And I, I wake and find her there. 
and it's scared to smile, and this should be cool, but there's something wrong. And I look, and it's not Gerta's eyes, and the eyes don't have Gerta's warmth and love. Something else is going on. And as I make that perception, Ram Gerta gets very tall, dressed all in white, he looks like gets very tall, as Gerta is very tall, and the eyes get bigger. So now slender person, big eyes, looking at me, no pretense of warmth, and I'm realizing that something major is, is happening, that I'm engaged in a struggle here and I'm about to lose. What I did was I fought myself up off of my back <laughs> to a seated position like that. And as I was like, ah! and I'm alone. As I got, got up there, I was alone. And now I suddenly realized that I've been hearing this boom, 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 thing had a very loud drum beat, and, and as <sighs> I'm like that, suddenly I can hear now, <laughs> the guitars and the, 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 the other drums, <laughs> and some saxophones, <laughs> and it's Kasha, a band playing at 2 a.m. at a club three blocks from my hotel. And one of those tambu lines had come <laughs> inside, I don't know why me or what have you, but I had my own kind of experience like that. And it was while hearing the other sounds come back and not having even heard the drum until I realized I was being deafened by the drum during the struggle to sit up. So there's something. That's I, a fantastic story. I'm a, now, the next morning, I tell my, my Haitian friend, Regine Fabius, at breakfast the next morning, we're sitting, I come out. And now, so we come out. I said, Regine, last night, uh, I thought I saw Gerta, but it turned out to be someone else, and then I heard the drums, and, and, and she goes, were you sleeping on your back? <laughs> I said, yes. She says, oh, that always happens to me when I sleep on my back. <laughs> <laughs> Pass the marmalade. <laughs> so it's like, um, so this kind of power, anyway. Yes, it's is, real. There is the power of the drum. <laughs> okay. Basically, the power of the drum. Yeah. It's a musical uh, aspect of our culture, but it also beyond music. Right. It's the relationship between music, work, entertainment, religion, etc. Right. Mm -hmm. Call me back. What's up? <laughs> wow, what a dimension that can bring to a project. Okay, now. okay. Because Bye. Americans don't don't know that power. They know we know the power of drums. Yes. You know. There's drum solos are there for a reason. Yeah. But but there's a whole other this is a whole other treasure trove that can really be tremendous. By the way, um, Chris, another person, just in terms of influences, but I before oh, oh before. sorry. Why KRS? Uh, <laughs> <It's wow. laughs> <It's laughs> yes, yeah, yes. Critique. Critique. Yes, yes. It uh, originally when I was um, but when I was ten years old, uh, I had this realization about myself uh, that uh, it was um, I had a I don't know in America you call it a nightmare. But in every other culture, it's more like a visualization. It's more like a, it's, 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 a, it's, it's like the state of knowing that you're asleep, but you're awake in your dream. And, uh, and I woke up one, one day in my dream, and uh, I was surrounded by a whole bunch of bugs. It was like, it was all these insects on the wall. It's like insects. Every kind of imaginable insect you could think about. I was stepping on them. I was moving them out of my face, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The dream made absolutely no. To this day, it, it, I still couldn't figure it out. What happened was when I woke up. Uh, I woke up and the room was empty. And I ran to my mother. I said, "Why? Well, I mean, did, well, where are those bugs? What happened to all the bugs that, that were in the room?" I said, what bugs? What are you talking about? You know, get out of here. It's time to go to school now. Let's go. And what, what happened was uh, I kept hounding her about these bugs and then what, what had happened, et cetera, et cetera. So she had, um, 
she had told me about this. Uh, my my middle name is Chris. C H R I S. Ah. But she I, she had all these books about other religions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and the ancient Egyptian way of spelling Christ was K R S T. <laughs> uh, and the Americanized way, of course, is, is K R. I mean, it's a C H R I S T. Uh, Krishna is K R S N A. Uh, and so, what, what happened was, um, I had left home about three years later. I was about 13 years old. I had left home, and I started to really get in depth into this whole. Chris thing, Christ thing, Chris. And uh, I bumped into a, a guy in the shelter, and I said, you know, he was telling me about something he had when he woke up in a room, and he was surrounded by a whole bunch of animals. And there was all kind of animals in the room. I said, you know, I had the same dream when I was 10 years old about being with a whole bunch of bugs. And he said that what he found out that it was, was that, uh, the, the, the animals in his life signify people. All walks in time, all kinds of people are going to be constantly drawn toward you, constantly in your path. You can't, you, you're going to be moving them, you're going to be stepping on them, you're going to be helping them, you're going to be eating them, you're going to be throwing them up. <laughs> There's all kind of people that's going to be in your life and you're meant to do communicative work, etc., etc. And I, I had said, well, wow, you know, this is way more why I even got into music, everything like that. And uh, what happened, he said, you have to, to, in order to realize it, you have to change your name, uh, which will change your consciousness. And so I said, well, uh, then I'm going to take KRS. Uh -huh. And uh, so who was that? Scott talking to you about that? No, no. this is somebody else. This is even before Scott. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, so wild. I said I'm gonna take KRS then. And when I changed, the minute I changed, because my first name is Lawrence, mm -hmm. Lawrence Chris Parker, and I dropped the Lawrence, and I just went with Chris Parker, and I spelled the K R I S P A R K E R. Uh, but then in my altered state, I become KRS. What happened was, a couple of other people started calling themselves KRS when I started rhyming. Somebody was K-R-E-S, K-R-Y-S, K-R-S, K-R-S-S. So I started calling myself KRS-1, the original, the first one, like that. And it just stuck. And it just stayed KRS One. KRS One. That was it. Incidentally, there's another dimension to your choice of K versus CH because you know CH as a K sound right. doesn't exist <coughs> in Creole. Oh. There is only K R I S. So you are Creole correct. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting. Is that it? Is that it is right. Yeah, no C H. No, there is no C H. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We are Creole. Drop that. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, also the, one other, just but for what it's worth, another person who, when you go to Haiti, you'll see his face everywhere on murals, wow. and and much adored by the Haitian people is Bob Marley. Wow. Prophet. I mean, they that's they adore him. Right. And again, it's interesting because to what extent do they understand the lyrics exactly? Yeah, right. mm. yeah. But they understand the, the, um, yeah. the, the communication of the vibe is intense. That's that's what music is uh, is is all about. I mean, that's that's what it is. It's not some the the words are like uh, is like the thing that it, the, the vibe travels on. Uh, but the the vibe, man, it, it's it's uh, there's a uh, in hip hop. There's a, there's a trance that most hip hoppers go into, which is called a flow. Some of them know they're going into it, some of them don't. But when you're on stage and the music is pounding, it's like a, it's a flow, whereas you're rhyming, but you're not thinking about what you're rhyming. It's like, 
It's like you're rhyming, you're steadily rhyming about this, about that. But your mind is thinking about, well, I got 10 more minutes. Uh, there's another show I gotta do tomorrow. Uh, what is, why is that person looking at me like that? But let me move to the other side of the stage uh, with security. Uh, there's another mm -hmm. thing going on, and your mouth is steadily going. It's, we call it the flow. Like you get into your flow, you get into the flow of what's going on, and uh, you have two level of consciousness. Yeah, it's like it's, it separates, yeah. Yeah. and one is just you become this. You start walking around, <laughs> you know, in, in this way that we've been stereotyped, <laughs> but you, you become a part of this this other. Thing and uh, the audience jumps into it too. Uh, the 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 audience gets into it too, and it, and it uh, the only thing with, with hip hop is it after a while it loses control. Oh. It loses control when when the flow gets good. It just the audience becomes one with the rapper, and if the rapper is not saying something of of relevance, or if, he's, if the rapper's just saying anything, it lose, the whole place loses control. And it's like, that's how you get into these, these fights and riots and this, that, and the other. But if you can control an audience, like if you're saying something that has to do, like, you know, you, your, your, your vocals is directing their movements. So like when we say, say ho, and I go, ho, that same energy can say, move to the left. They'll move. Move to the right. They'll move. Go back. Go forward. It was like a, a group by the name of Naughty by Nature uh, did it brilliantly with this record um, called Hip Hop Hooray. And it was like, they used to go, hey, ho, hey. And the crowd, it's, a, it's this vibe. The people just start going, Side to side, whole crowds of people. Hey, oh. but they but they're able to control it. Like you, you take it to a level, you bring it down, and then you stop it. Some people take it to the level, and they say, "All right, bye. Mm -hmm. Show's over. I gotta go." And everybody's just they're left on this level, and and it's it's just. <laughs> Chris, let me ask you, content wise, for the Haiti Opus. Yes. It's got to be, or does it? I'm, I'm making certain assumptions yeah. about it, no, mainly because I know what you do. Right. Obviously, I mean, obviously we're talking edutainment, because yeah. that's yeah. one of Chris's big things is education through entertainment. So it's got to be history lesson, right. social comment, yes. drama, yeah. <laughs> uh, humor, yes. uh, and probably a few other levels. But how far back do you picture uh, like if there's a narrative involved for the for the for the magnum opus, right? Does this does this start with the marine occupation, or does it start with the first slave arrival, or does it start with Columbus arriving when the Indians are there? Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, I would start it from Columbus. It would give a clear picture. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it would give a clear picture as to everyone's role. Mm -hmm. uh, Columbus could just as easily be. Uh, Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. just as easily, uh, with his caring, the care part. You know what I mean? Like, why would that line really care? The Christopher Columbus, the, all the way up to George Bush, to Clinton. Why would America, England, France, Spain, Spain, you know, why would they really care? Really, the original purpose of them being there in the beginning was clear away, it's money time, and uh, you know, let's put these Africans there to train them and send them off to America. I mean, you know, it's, uh, I would start from the, uh, from the, uh, the Columbus, well, actually from the Arawak Indians perspective, but then, you know, then coming, like in the beginning, Haiti was, Mm -hmm. Or oh, maybe it wasn't even called Haiti. I mean, like, it had to have, a, I guess, another name. Giskea. 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 Wow. But, That's oh, interesting yeah. to know. 
Like that, that is like a wealth of information here in America. Get scared. Get those kids scared. Is that in the language of the uh, Arabs or the Arabs? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the name Haiti is also a genuine. I mean, I there was IT, IT, but IT was uh, the name of the land uh, occupied by the Tainos and the Arawa came and for them it was Kiskeya. Oh. So A-Y-I-T-I-I-T, -I 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 -T, the original, before Kiskeya. Oh. I, so how do we go back to IT? IT. IT. I explain. Uh, so you are IT, Kiskeya, then the Spanish came and called the new land Hispaniola. That means little Spain. Hispania, Hispaniola. Okay. Right. Then the French came and forget about Hispania and call it Saint Domingue. Saint Domingue. And it was Saint Domingue. Even the Spanish agree with Saint Domingue and they call themselves Santo Domingo. Who oh, yeah. The Spanish. Yeah, but who's Santo Domingo? Who's Santo Domingo? Is that just one of the saints? Saint Domingue, I don't know. I some, think it's some. I think Saint Dominique. Oh, shh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> then, <laughs> when, we, when we freed ourselves in 1804, after 14 years of fighting against the French, against the British, against the Spaniards, when we free ourselves, our forefathers, our grandfathers, our, say, we don't want a land called Saint Domingue. We don't want a land called Hispaniola. We want to be back to the original name of the land. Okay? And the Saline, which was the liberator of the country, said, okay. You heard of him, Jean-Jacques Dessalines? Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Dessalines said, okay, back to the sons of sun, because we are all sons of sun. Petit Soleil. And it was IT. He selected the name IT because IT means in the old Arawak language, son of sun. The same way in Peru it was Inca, mm -hmm. son of sun, because <coughs> related to sun. Mm -hmm. So it was IT. The name was Kiskeya IT. And uh, that was it. Mm -hmm. So we select the name and we kept the name mm -hmm. IT. But then, of course, as we pronounce it over Haiti. Haiti. Yeah. And I put an H. Right. Before. <sighs> Chris Bessalin is the one who tore the white out of the French tricolor yeah. to create the Haitian flag. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's what you want. Because the French flag was blue, white, and red. Yep. And he says, no more white. <laughs> <laughs> There's a great character that I wish to tell you about for the early uh, Native American days. So what's her name that, that you love so much? The queen? Anacaona. And, don't you know about Anacaona? Yeah. Anacaona Anacaona was a princess, a, a, a Taino princess, an Indian, but you call it Indian. Mm -hmm. There was, of course, no, no Indian. <laughs> and uh, she was in these. She was a Taino princess. She's from where I'm from in She was a poet, a poetess. She was, she did poetry. And uh, she had uh, a kingdom, we call it Cassicato, uh, in the south province of Haiti. And uh, she was worshipped by her subjects, 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 subjects. Adore. And uh, she was caught by one of the most fierce kings, warrior, Kakabo. Then 
in Espanol and on account of try to please them, to sing for them, to play music, poetry. By the way, in this narrative that will occur, and there'll, there'll be this line of great Haitian heroes and heroines like Anna Karina, if I said that right, and Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and Louverture uh, uh, Toussaint, and Toussaint Louverture, and, and Charlene Perrault, and, and on and on and on, and all the endless heroes of the last 10 years who've given their life <coughs> Uh, for Haiti, and of course there'll be that line you described, the Christopher Columbus through George Bush, right, through right. the <laughs> stopping of Roosevelt and everybody yeah, else right. in the jump of the Clinton. Line. Then there's that other line that that is the most important of all, in a way, I think, from what I can tell from the outside yes. of the fate of Haiti, and that's those nameless, faceless people we, who, who we know only their employer the CIA, who, who affect everything. And I don't know even know if, was there a version of the CIA for Columbus? Or what they said like that? I don't know who was. But, but how to get them in, man, is like hard, because there's not literature on this. Uh -huh. You know? I don't know where you're going to draw from that. You may think I'm crazy. Maybe the CIA has nothing to do with it. Maybe. <laughs> but Sean, how can we get them in there? How do, how do you manifest that? That uh, is there a history that that goes prior to that? Is was there a force like the CIA in the life of Haiti um, with Franklin Delano Roosevelt? Uh, when when or, or going farther back, the, maybe the United United Fruit Company was the CIA of the day. Is that a possibility? Did they do maybe. the CIA job in those days? Yeah, maybe. Maybe the United Food, the standard food. Maybe. Mm. I never know. Mm. get them in, because if you leave them out, you, right. you're not telling the story. Then there's that other force that right. has been there, right. actually, and that's the embassy, the State Department. Yes. Um, and, and, and there's, I mean, Chris, you must have theories. Forget Haiti for a second. It's all over the world. It's in this country. Yes. I, I know there's this thing, the National Security Council, yes. and I know they make foreign policy, but I used to, in school, they told me that the State Department made the foreign policy, and I don't know who's telling who that. Is the CIA working for one or both of them, or, or are they working for the CIA? Is there one person inside the CIA who finally says yes or no to all of that? I don't think I'll tell you the truth. like the KGB, the FBI, the CIA, uh, the, uh, what is this, others, uh, mm -hmm. the, these, these agencies are agencies that can be employed by big business. The bulldogs on behalf the of build capitalism. The bulldogs on behalf of capitalism, imperialism, uh, to do this work, etc. It's like paying, it's like, like selling your soul to the devil. They get something in return. Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, how much they are actually involved? You know, I think a lot of things are blamed on the CIA uh, that they really didn't have anything to do with directly. Because <clears throat> I think I see a more active response in big business. Just Exxon, British Petroleum, McDonald's, uh, AT&T, IBM. I, I see more activity 
in them in these countries than I do the government. The problem is government is not acting uh, in these countries in, in any kind of fashion. Uh, maybe, see, the, the, the thing with the American government is at least when the CIA goes into a situation, they at least try to give a, a farce that everything's all right. And they'll give, you know, the illusion that everything's cool, everything, just why are you so angry? Everything's fine. Look, the kids are going to school, mm -hmm. and they will be going. Look, they're vaccinated. They will be vaccinated. And people are looking, look, we just have to control it all. <laughs> that's, that's our, we just want, don't overstep your boundaries and try to go against us in this because we want the land for power. Uh, I see big business though. The way Haiti is now, I, that looks more like an uncaring businessman. Uh, yeah, okay, because because you're right. I think like it's no coincidence right. that the day that President Aristide, um, uh, the, the, the he Aristide helped push uh, for an increase in the minimum wage. Yes. The coup occurred the day before that increase was meant to go into effect. I agree with you that that's not a coincidence. Right. And maybe, so you get, you get going back, even Jimmy Carter, why he was involved with this kind of stuff, I don't know, because I like Jimmy Carter, yes. but the Caribbean Basin Initiative. Right. We're gonna, gonna help um, create um, a, a cheap, energetic, docile labor pool for right. American business in right. the Caribbean, right on our doorstep. We will increase profits beyond belief. We're not going to have to pay those American workers what yeah, they've been right. demanding. That's out of control. Right. So you get a lot of tremendous, a lot of big business energy focused on the Caribbean. Yeah. And then, as the years go by, and more and more big business gets down there and starts making their profits with their assembly plants and their and their mangoes and whatever, then one day this guy, Aristide, gets elected president. A leader gets in president, and he's not friends with big business. He's not friends with the US State Department. And he is now pushing for labor, creation of labor unions. He's pushing for increase of minimum wage. He achieves increase of, now that's a moment where I, now I can picture the CIA guy. And I don't know who, what his, how he got to this moment right. at the bar, right. at the hotel in the Capitol. And he's telling someone, this guy's gotta go. He's, he's, he's hurting America. He's hurting capitalism because if he can get the minimum wage increased in Haiti, the shithole of the hemisphere, you don't think the workers in the Bahamas and in Belize and in yeah. Mexico, they're not going to say, hey, wait, if the Haitians got it, we got to get it. Right. So Aristide is, is Clinton with his free trade thing. Yeah. He has all the presidents want to be right in the big yeah. business. They'd rather have that than have everybody have a home. Right. They'd rather see big business right. prospering. I still, I, I sort of got it. I, I don't get it. Yeah. But, but it's true. So. But the CIA then, then becomes helpful. They, they somehow become helpful. And whether or not they, you know, they've been accused of, of, uh, of guiding, uh, right. you know, the Haitian military and providing them with foolproof uh, scenarios for coup that can work this time. Don't right. fuck it up with your little homemade right. coup. Yeah, we'll right. give you a coup that'll stick. Right. You're gonna hear this, <laughs> you know? Right. So that's when, that's where I disagree with you because at a certain moment in time, in some bar, right. in some hotel somewhere, the CIA becomes all powerful because they they made the phone call. They heard it from someone. I don't right. know who. Someone uh, in the right. State Department or in the National Security Council or in the Trilateral Commission. Yeah. Someone said, "Dump him," and now they're free to well, say vague things to generals and local um, uh, 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 local businessmen who yeah. are, are profiting on all this. They're able to say, "Take him. You won't get hurt." Take him down. Well, those people, I think the one who would actually say that, we probably will never meet or be able to see. Uh, and I don't know if it's one person. I, I don't, I still don't think it's one person, but I, I, this, this is what I'm getting at. In, um, I think it was World War One when America fought Hitler. Two. That was two, right? Yeah. And Japan was one. One was Germany the first time around, the Kaiser. Right. right. Two 
Hitler, and Japan. And Japan. Okay, that's what's confusing. That's what like the Italians are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, World War II then. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's a historical fact that, it, that um, Rockefeller mm -hmm. owned, a, owned oil, owned a lot of oil uh, plants here in America, and sold oil to the American military as well as the German military. So this is a businessman. He was, in the, he was in war for business. And the same gas that fueled the German tanks fueled the American tanks. My point is that I think the same situation might lie here. There's a grand scheme that's called top secret information that we can only speculate on or theorize. We might be right in the end conclusion, mm -hmm. but the, actually what spurs our thinking can only be a spiritual thing because in written hard documents, we won't get them unless we invade the Pentagon and <laughs> dig up somebody's fall. But uh, I think there is one, maybe up to three people that control all of the Caribbean that can still use the CIA, the FBI, the National Guard, the Marines, the Air Force, the Navy, uh, to do its bidding. I see the CIA as executive soldiers. Uh, just like you have the Army. Facilitators. Facilitators, right. They are, they are, you know, so everything doesn't need a police officer in uniform. Everything doesn't need an Air Force to bomb. Some things need a suit and a tie and a strategic plan that goes in and gets a certain job done for the good of this certain power structure. However, from a metaphysical point of view, everything changes, everything. And the best fight that we can actually have is to preserve the lives of youth. And I'll tell you why, because Naturally, no matter whoever this guy or woman or people are, is pointing fingers, they're going to die. Natural. No one, not the CIA, not the Army, no one has figured that one out yet. Mm -hmm. They're going to die. The question is, who takes their place? Mm -hmm. What we've been faced with is generation after generation after generation of people uh, uh, an oppressor teaching an oppressor teaching an oppressor teaching an oppressor. If we can stop the chain of oppressor education, eventually the situation in Haiti will change. The situation in the, in the Caribbean altogether will change because, like at one time, if we were sitting 200 years ago in America in this same area in Manhattan, you would say, oh, things here are never going to change for black people. This is, this is the, the pits here where nothing's happening. And there was a Jonathan Demi there years ago uh, saying, this is, this is an atrocity. This has got to change. And he might have lived in England, maybe, or, or somewhere else, not America. And uh, somehow along the line, the consciousness of people, what's good, what's good for them doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't need to be anymore. And so it changes. Certain techniques of teaching fall to the wayside. Certain people who now get in as the new oppressor is not really as oppressive as the one before. Uh, so getting up into like revolution, strategic, if, if youth are constantly killed, oppression continues because no one replaces the oppressor when he or she dies. So whatever their plan is, if the, like here in America, youth are dying more than adults. 
that's an atrocity. That's like youth would say, like you see on the TV every day, oh, is this about the youth dying of gun violence? And mm -hmm. we just go, oh, it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a big deal. It's a big deal for the world because some, well, some of these youth, if 100 youth die a day, one or two of them might have been the one mm -hmm. to go into office to change that situation mm -hmm. there. But if youth continues to die, oppression continues to live. And one thing to keep, I think the battle would be, if it is the CIA, Army, et cetera, et cetera, they have children themselves. They have people they're educating themselves. Now, you are this, you are mm -hmm. that, you are worth this, you need to have that. Yeah. And the one thing we have in our favor is the fact that youth is always rebelling against their parents. So this is why I think at another level why a lot of Haitian youth are dying. Why oh, youth for sure are dying because that's that's the winning game. If we can implant an education or a program that enhances the lives of youth, where they are able to live, to reach an age where they can become the oppressor, then we can see a concrete change. You're right. And that's one of the most appalling things about the Haiti situation because the, 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 the excellence of the systematic elimination of the best people. Yes. Uh, you know, the youth groups have been so targeted. Yeah. Um, the community leaders have been so targeted. Yeah. The elected officials in the last election have been so targeted that it's, it's like, of course, if you watch Haiti for 10 years, you start, keep, you, you start going, where do they keep getting all these heroes from? Right. 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 Where do they keep right. coming from? Right. But still, the systematicness this time has been absolutely, yeah. especially horrendous. And that sounds like, like again, like wonderful extra, you know, I don't know. Yeah. No, it is, I, I wouldn't doubt CIA intervention in any way. But what you're saying, it's not as simple as the CIA. You can't, it, no, that's not it's, the end it's of the story. No, it's not. I still think they're paid. Or got some, something in it for America, something but not even America, I don't even think they're down with America. I just think they're down with another clique. Mm -hmm. They're a part of somebody or something else that doesn't have America in mind, doesn't have none of these countries in mind. They have the world order in mind. Mm -hmm. And they can be paid, hired, et cetera, et cetera. Because I noticed, just to get off into something, but uh, when Mandela came to America, now it was the CIA that helped put Mandela in jail. Mm -hmm. When they when he came back, it was the CIA that was was uh, guarding him. Mm -hmm. It was sort of like you know either it's either or it's either whoever paid the CIA then Mandela paid them now, mm -hmm. or they put him in jail and then took him out. Chose to take him. Chose out. to take him out, move him around, mm -hmm. and now he's the president of South Africa for mm -hmm. some other grand purpose in the scheme of what's going on. It's either or, and then they're both valid to think about but which one actually is there. Maybe one of us should join the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that Jean and I have each been accused of being the CIA already, so maybe it's your turn. <laughs> wow. Are you guys hungry? I bet we might have some. Yeah. Oh, good. It's ready? Yeah? Good.